Hello, everyone. I'm Gabriel Berzin, Senior Manager Digital Strategy at the Neuroleadership Institute. Welcome to the end of your week. Way to go. We're almost there. I hope you have some downtime ahead of you. Thanks for joining your Brain at Work Live. Looking forward to the future with Bob Johansson and Amy Edmondson. So we hope you kick back, turn your phones off, turn off those inessential programs on your computer. Help, it, it sort of helps you maximize your attention. It'll bring you to insight faster with these great speakers today. And it also helps the quality of the audio and video of today's broadcast. So grab a pen and paper, as David will probably prompt you for some reflection moments today. Have a stretch, grab a water, maybe a tea, and settle in with us for an hour. Uh, we'd like to welcome you back to those who have attended before. We've been running these weekly webinars for nearly two months now. Um, and we also want to welcome our first timers out there, as well as another audience, two audiences to address, LinkedIn Live, uh, which we're simulcasting, and YouTube Live. So for those of you familiar with our co-founder and CEO, Dr. David Rock, or neuroleadership in general, you're probably familiar with one of his best-selling books, Your Brain at Work. Uh, it is also the title of our blog and podcast, uh, which is why we're calling today's session Your Brain at Work Live. Um, it's essentially a live taping of an episode, so thank you for being a part. Um, and if you haven't subscribed yet, you can go for it now. Anna Vargas should be dropping a chat, and Mary Grace Rapola at LinkedIn Live should be dropping a, a link where you can subscribe now on your preferred platform. You'll see all of season one there and the first couple episodes of season two, which go live every Wednesday uh, morning, weekly. Um, a fun announcement is that our humble podcast is just recently featured on new and noteworthy Apple's uh, podcast homepage, right alongside the New York Times and NPR and my personal favorite, Talking Sopranos. So uh, a couple of quick housekeeping notes. Uh, we ask you, for those of you that are on the webinar, to keep an eye on the chat. You want to maximize that window. Uh, there's a number of comments that will be coming through, and it's easier to, to sort of follow along there. We have a dedicated team in NLI that will respond in real time to those chats. Um, and if you're there now, go ahead and tell us where you're calling from, city, state, country, whatever you'd like to share. Uh, and for those of you on the webinar, if you want your comments to be seen by everyone, go ahead and select all panelists and attendees. And if you have specific questions for the panelists, um, you can use the Q&A section, which David will be monitoring when he's interviewing uh, both Bob and Amy. Uh, and for those of you on LinkedIn Live, Mary Grace Rapola and a couple other folks from NLI will be monitoring the chat there. Um, so you can keep an eye on it for, uh, full, uh, for upcoming resources there as well. A couple quick questions that tend to come up, I'll answer now. Uh, will there be a recording? Yes, by end of business today, you will receive an email from Mary Grace Rapola. And for those of you on LinkedIn Live, just at mention Mary Grace and she can help you. She'll have a form that you can fill out and ensure that you too will also get a follow-up of the recording. Um, the other question is, will there be a copy of the slides? Uh, that is reserved for corporate members and current clients only. But the truth is, it's not a very slide-heavy deck today. It's mostly about the conversation. So let me turn our attention to today's webinar. We are very pleased and fortunate to have two really great guests as we have every week. Uh, first, Amy Edmondson, who is a Novartis Professor of Leadership and Management at Harvard Business School, who is also the founder of Psychological Safety, and Bob Johansson, who is a PhD author and distinguished fellow at the Institute for the Future. So I uh, hope you guys will be able to come on video and show your faces. Uh, those are the folks we'll be talking to today, and today's conversation will be facilitated, as always, by our co-founder and CEO, Dr. David Rock. And with that, over to you, David. Are you there? There we go. Yes, just had to find that mute button. It's great to be uh, be back with everyone. Bob and Amy, can you come uh, onto camera so we can make sure you're there and just do a quick sound check and say hello? There we are. Bob, sure. good to Hi. see you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, good morning. Excellent. Good morning to you. Amy, great to have you with us. Uh, you, great you, to you come be here. Through. Excellent. Thanks both for joining us. Um, I'm going to uh, spend about 10 to 15 minutes the most kind of uh, sharing some research, gathering data from folks. You guys feel free to go off uh, off video if you like for a few minutes. We'll stay up to you. Um, and uh, then I'm going to bring Bob in. And Bob, we're going to um, talk about the future um, and also how to think about the future, something that everyone's uh, kind of a lot more interested in now all of a sudden. Um, how do we predict the future better? Um, and then uh, secondly, we'll spend some time with Amy and think about um, you know what the best companies are doing and why and how and uh, how to really keep the the safety high of all types. Um, so let's dig in. Um, this on screen, you've got um, 
I should have given you a trigger warning, I guess. On screen, you've got kind of the stages we've been going through from our perspective. And I think, while not for everyone, for a majority of people, this has been a, um, a, an experience of psychological shock and not as a metaphor, but actually as, um, as in acute distress disorder, which is in the DSMV um, of severe psychological trauma um, of so, you know, something so large, so unexpected, so unprepared for. Um, and I think we're starting to shift out of that shock phase now. And, and the companies that are trying to like address tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people are shifting from kind of getting people safe to, you know, to now kind of helping people you know, focus and helping people be productive and just kind of helping people move forward, uh, you know, with the painful challenges we have. That's that kind of next stage. And then at some point as things, you know, get back to something like normal, uh, there'll be a chance to really rehabilitate. So, you know, these things happen physically if we, you know, fall down the stairs and break a leg. Uh, these things are happening psychologically to us. And I think it's helpful to understand the, you know, the, the psycho psychological correlates are often as bad or even worse than the physical. And maybe Amy and I will talk about that. So these are the kind of stages we're going through. And at, at NLI, we've been talking a lot about um, the, the, the biggest variable to, to handle personally and individually and organizationally. And it's really, it's really a threat level. And if, you've, if you haven't seen this research yet, it's really important research. It's basically pulling apart or kind of getting more granular on the level of threat that people experience. So it turns out that it's not just like, you know, slightly strong, a bit more strong, a bit more strong. There are actually three different qualities of threat that occur based on how far away you think a danger is kind of unconsciously. Um, level one is, is, uh, is a fairly functional state. Um, you can still do just about every type of work, um, although you'll be less creative, notably less creative. But otherwise, you can do every type of work. Some work even better. You're, you're more focused. And it's when you sense a danger in your broader environment, but it's not necessarily coming at you in any way. Um, so you're alert, but not alarmed. Level two threat is you, you, you actually feel like there's a danger in your neighborhood, something that could actually affect you. Um, so, you know, the virus was in another country. Now it's like in your country and maybe in your state. You're not sure, but it's, you're a lot more alarmed. Um, and in this state, you know, in this level two threat where the alarm system's starting to go off, uh, there's a big reduction in quality perception, cognition, creativity, collaboration. You basically make a lot of mistakes cognitively. Um, you can still delete emails, you can still schedule meetings, you can still respond to things reasonably well, but doing original deep thinking, very, very difficult. Uh, creating things very, very difficult. So that's level two. Level three is a threat like coming right at you. So that's like a, um, you know, like a hurricane overhead versus level two is a hurricane kind of, you know, heading towards your town versus level one is, oh, there's a hurricane somewhere. So as these things kind of ratchet up, very different processes kick in in the brain. Um, and at level three, basically it's all physical. Uh, there's really minimal uh, cognitive processing available. So this is a, um, a construct we've been using. And I think that the critical factor here is not just kind of identifying what threat level you are, but also how do you keep yourself at no more threatened than level one? Um, how do you do that? No more threatened than level one. And particularly for leaders who need to think deeply, super critical that you're remaining calm because everyone takes on your threat level automatically. Um, so there's no adaptive value in terms of any kind of cognitive or collaborative task for being any higher than level one, but many, many people are there. But let's find out. Let's do a quick poll of you. Um, what threat level are your, if you're from an organization, your people leaders? So we've been tracking this data um, and, and I'd like to put up a poll. What threat level are your people leaders or people managers on average? Just pick a number. You don't have to press return. Just put a number in there. Of course, average is live, but it's just helpful to see the variance between levels and people and over time. Just put in there. Uh, I can see about 250. Let's get a few more. We've got 700 on the line. Um, we go about 350. Let's get a few more. It's really interesting to see the data. I'll share it out with you in a moment. Um, so, I mean, level zero is neutral or positive. Um, and, you know, right now we've only got a handful of people at that 2%, right? That's not normal times. <laughs> um, let's give it another five seconds. Four, three, two, one. Okay, we can close it off. We've got about 440 responses. Thanks, folks. So I'll tell you the data. Um, uh, like level one is 43%, a bit under half. Um, that's not a problem, except that 50%... Uh, <laughs> It is at level two. Um, people at level two are making very poor decisions. They're, ma they're, they're making perceptual errors, cognitive errors, errors of judgment, errors of social cognitive um, mistakes. So all sorts of things start to happen. And then you've got 5% at level three as well. 
uh, which is, you know, really scary. So it's not a healthy state at all to be in level two and individuals, teams and organizations need to do everything they can to, to minimize this. Let's do another poll. Uh, so now we're talking about your frontline employees. So we talked about your people managers. What do you think your level of threat of your frontline employees is? Take a moment to, to click. Okay, let's see what's coming in. We've got 400 coming in. Um, what's your frontline employees? Wow, really interesting. Give you another moment. We've got 430. Let's get a few more and we'll close that off in five, four, three, two, one. Fantastic, we've got 436 respondents. So thanks very much. We've been collecting this and we'll start to share this out in the next few weeks and show you the trend over time and the variance. But there's a consistent pattern, which is that frontline employees are not okay. <laughs> That's the consistent, consistent pattern. Uh, and people managers are slightly less not okay, but still not okay. Um, and these, these are threat levels that are, that are unsafe on, on, on every level, um, including having a big effect on people's immune system. Um, so what you have for, for frontline employees here are um, basically neutral 2%. That's good news though, is, you know, eight companies at 2%. Level one, uh, you've got 26% here. So you had 50% before. So you've only got 26%, about a quarter at level one. Now you have over 50% at level two. And now you have nearly 20% at level three. Um, that's a problem. So level two and three together, uh, nearly three quarters. So that's frontline employees, nearly three quarters of the frontline employees out there are unmanageable, unsustainable and unhealthy levels of threat. And by the way, this level of threat happens to impair immune system, which is not a good thing. So just, you know, with, this is the data out there. We believe that, that one of the most critical things to focus on is the, the threat level that your people are experiencing for so many reasons. And we've been developing kind of the critical habits for yourself, for your team and for the organization to, you know, to address this. Couple other quick things. Thanks everyone for doing that. I appreciate your um, uh, responding to that. Couple of the things that we're seeing in the talent space um, kind of so far, and uh, we're talking to a lot of companies. We're actually having these events. Uh, we're having three or four events every week now for senior talent folks, uh, smaller groups where we're studying and together kind of exploring ideas. We're having hundreds of, literally hundreds of companies every week. We're in these one-on-one -on -one sessions with. Um, that, are, that have been really powerful. So what, what we're seeing is many firms are doing heroic work, incredible work, literally heroic work to ensure physical safety. And some of the stories are really, really uh, inspiring. Uh, and I'm gonna say some are deeply considering psychological safety. So it's like there's a small number of companies doing a really great job at that, um, but it's not, doesn't seem to be the pattern that everyone's doing it really well. Most companies are you know, considering it at least a little bit. I, I would agree with that. Uh, we're also analyzing a big focus on inclusion, big focus on inclusion, much bigger than we ever have. In fact, it's become one of our biggest areas and it's happened very quickly. Uh, also, we're seeing many sacred cows being paused. So things that maybe in normal time were kind of, you know, challenging, but okay, like the 360 every, you know, half a quarter, the performance management system, the talent processes, uh, many things are actually being paused um, in this time. And we've been curious about what you are pausing. I've got a quick poll in a moment, but... Um, these are, you know, these are some things that we're starting to see. And one of the biggest trends that I'm starting to see now as we shift from, uh, from the shock to the more pain stage is people are coming out of level three, particularly at the top, um, the executives and also the talent teams. I'm seeing the senior talent teams have moved back towards level one. Um, so what we're starting to see is people actually thinking about how they can use this crisis now. And there are three kind of big trends that I'm seeing. Companies saying, oh, we want to really redefine our culture right now. Um, use this opportunity to, to reform who we are and what matters to us. What a great thing to do with this crisis, right? Use the opportunity to redefine what, what's important in your organization. And companies are realizing, this is funny, they're realizing the culture wasn't the building. Um, it wasn't the great, you know, amazing 100 million or 10 billion, whatever dollar investment they made into um, you know, this building is actually the way people interact with each other, or as we say at NLI, the shared everyday habits make up the culture. Um, so they're thinking a lot about in this new world, what will it be? What a wonderful thing. Also reinventing leadership development and learning. Um, and, and I'll ask you some questions on that in a moment, but it's such an interesting time to do that because, um, you know, learning is unbelievably ineffective still and based on some incredibly outdated uh, philosophies. 
Uh, and sort of the forcing function of having to go virtual is creating great opportunities to actually innovate on not just process, but also content around learning. And, and it's providing some interesting opportunities. And thirdly, uh, performance management is an opportunity to really rethink how you do that, how you do goal setting and teaming, all sorts of things. So these are, you know, these are big things happening. And a quick poll before we go to Bob, that's my last one. Um, what are you doing in learning? If we can pop this poll up. Um, what are you doing around, and when I say learning, I mean leadership development and, you know, broadly all the learning uh, that you're doing. We sometimes segment into human skills versus technical, but just broadly, you know, all the learning, what are you doing in your organization? I'm really curious to see what kind of numbers come up. Um, if you're not from an organization or you don't know, that's fine, don't click, but otherwise I'd love to get hundreds of responses here. We have 750 people on the line. So what are you doing in learning? taking the same learning and basically just sort of trying to do your best to do it um you know just just to make it kind of online are you cancelling is the second option you know all or most things or are you the third one is are you significantly innovating on both the content and on the delivery so really using the opportunity or are you just innovating on delivery but you are really innovating or have you paused let's see we've got 400 respondents there let's get a few more <clears throat> We can get up maybe up to 500 would be amazing. What are you doing uh, in learning? Pick one of these. Um, okay, let's close that off in five, four, three, two, one. I'm really curious. Let's see what comes up. Thanks, Gabe. Uh, wow, look at that. It's inspiring. The, the, actually, the biggest one, 48%, significantly innovating on content and delivery. It's exciting to see that people are thinking about this. Only 3% have cancelled all or most. It's good to see. 21% uh, paused and still deciding. So, you know, one in five pause, but you know, half of organizations, certainly of this group, uh, significantly innovating on both. Um, and only 11% only innovating on delivery. That's interesting. Um, so 18% taking the same learning, doing similarly online. Um, so, <clears throat> so those are, you know, really interesting findings, just as sort of background. And uh, we'll be sharing this out in all sorts of articles and polls and posts and things coming up. Uh, but really appreciate your, um, your uh, insights there. And I, I see there's a few questions. Um, I don't know if I'll, I'll go into it right now, but I'll, I'll see if we can include these questions as we dig further in. I think it's a good time to get to Bob. So Bob, if you want to come uh, off uh, mute there and uh, Bob, it's, it's great to have you with us. I know we've worked together at a couple of the neuroleadership summits over the years back in San Francisco was the first one like 10 yes. years ago and then a couple of years ago. And I love what you do at the Institute for the Future. It's, uh, it's I mean, it's really the world's leading futurist, um, you know, future studies organization. And you, you do fantastic work. And folks who are not connected to them, they just do amazing work and um, really, really worthwhile to, uh, to follow. So Bob, thanks for having us here. And I have a question for you first. Um, sure. And, and maybe I should apologize for this question in advance, but uh, you're a futurist. <laughs> so did you see this coming? <laughs> well, we don't predict the future, as you know, even though our brains uh, try to predict the future. Uh, we, we did see pandemics on the horizon um, beginning in 2009. Um, we actually did a, a massive online multiplayer game called Superstruct and had pandemics as one of the scenarios to which we were responding. But since 9-11, I've been talking about what the Army War College calls the VUCA world, uh, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Um, I now teach there, and I've kind of flipped that into a positive VUCA, uh, right. vision, understanding, clarity, and agility. But yeah, we've been talking about the VUCA world for a long time. I think the person who got it most right in terms of this specific pandemic was Bill Gates. He was huh. right on in his forecast five years ago. It's just very few people listened. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's, it's amazing. You know, he's, he, I've actually been a few times to his, uh, his, his institute there, uh, the mm -hmm. foundation. Done yes, some work we with have too. We work with, with them and, and they're terrific. I mean, what amazed me was the investment that they've put into yes. that. I mean, this is not like, oh yeah, Bill's got, you know, a few people working on a foundation. This is like two and a half thousand people. And, right. and he works really hard on that place. Like it's, it's an incredibly complex uh, organization, you know, two and a half thousand employees and tens of thousands of people, you know, I mean, he's taking his money and doing his very best to like thoughtfully, intelligently help the world. And then people I hate agree. him. I, what, like no good deed goes unpunished, I think is the phrase that comes to mind. I mean, he, 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 you know, he's put his money to probably the best use you can, you know, intelligently and everything. And yet there's still so much blowback, but he, he definitely saw, um, 
you know, saw a lot of things coming, has been pushing out there. So tell me about how do we think better about the future, seeing as we seem to have done a bad job of it in, 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 as a society in some ways, uh, except yeah. for Bill. How do we think better about the future? What can you tell us? So I'm going to share our basic approach to thinking about planning for, and most importantly, making the future. Um, and it's all about seeking clarity. Uh, and we use foresight, not prediction. Uh, we use foresight to provoke your insight. And ultimately, the way we get evaluated is, does the foresight provoke an insight that leads to action? Mm. Um, being a futurist is not about predicting the future. So it really isn't a question of, does the forecasted future happen? That's the way you evaluate a fortune teller. The way you evaluate a futurist mm. is, does the forecasted future provoke your insight that leads to a better response? And it's all about seeking clarity. So the central message I want to share with you this morning is the future, this post-virus future, the future will reward clarity, but punish, punish certainty. So you want to be very clear where you're going, but very flexible how you get there. And let me roll out this model and share it with you. It always begins with hindsight. Um, which is your pre-virus set of stories about the past, the present, and the future. And there's no choice. We all have that. It's just some of us are more open to the future and some of us are more closed. And there's a neuroscience link here because the neuroscientists tell us each of us has personal neural story nets. And as futurists, we try to break into those nets with foresight. Uh, so next, David, um, foresight is a story from the future, uh, and it's future back. And this is something else I want to share with you this morning. In a crisis like this, thinking present forward just doesn't work well at all because the present is so terribly, horribly, frighteningly noisy. <laughs> But if you think future back, it's actually easier to look long and work backwards. Right. So foresight is a story from the future, plausible, internally consistent, and provocative with signals to bring it to life. And we use the word signals much like what you do at NLI. Uh, we, William Gibson said, the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. But you said in your communications in one of these early podcasts, quiet signals in a noisy brain. <laughs> I mean, all of us have noisy brains right now, um, and we've got to sense those quiet signals. So yeah, it's a really big point. Just one a, big, more. a couple of comments yeah, there. The, the, um, we, we've actually been studying this one for about 15 years, just the way we, with sort of my personal obsession about the, the inside experience, and it literally are weak electrical activations, weak electrical signals that just you can't literally hear if the ambient level of electrical activity yes. is higher. Um, and it's like hearing a you know, quiet cell phone ringing in a loud party um, so that yeah, the signals exactly. are from there, but you don't hear them. It's, 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 it's not just a metaphor. It's literally an electrical activity spike above a baseline of electrical activity. Yeah. Right. No, I think you're right. And uh, we have at Institute for the Future, uh, this kind of global database of signals. And we think mm. the discipline of collecting signals and then organizing them and mapping them is just so important to understanding the future and getting that future back perspective. Can I just so ask you a question though, just one, to clarify? Yeah. So, um, and we'll, we'll get through the model, but the, the, you're saying we have to work from the future back because the current is, is just so noisy. Um, and right. I, I agree with that. If every, if half the employees are at level two threat, you know, like this, people can't be sensing any insight right. level two threat. There's not, I mean, live in level one threat, you hardly get any insights. Um, exactly. It's a huge reduction, even at level one threat. So, so the, you know, current is so noisy. Um, so just say more like we've got to look from the future back and just, just give us a little bit more about that. Sure, because uh, you know, people always ask me, I, I've been doing this more than 30 years and the Institute's been doing it for 50 years. We're the longest running futures think tank. Uh, and what I'm often asked is, how can you do 10 year forecasting? I can't even do one or two year forecasting. Right. And the reason is because it's easier to look long right. than it is to look at the present. And particularly during a crisis, you can't look present forward. You have to look future back. And yet it's so hard unless you have that ability to step back, 
to look long and then come back to the crisis because you you right. do have to respond to the crisis but instead of doing now next future you need to do now future next oh. or those of you who use horizon one horizon two horizon three which is a good model it's just you have to change the order you need to do horizon one horizon three and then horizon two nice thank you for clarifying that i th i thought i had i just want to really crystallize and get the insight and now i've got it yeah it's, great it's, it's you've got great. to go way out it's easier to go long and then come back then you that's right you you got to pick the sweet spot and you know in 50 years of doing this we think 10 years is the sweet spot right. for most topics now in things right. like global climate disruption or food security you have to go a bit further out than that but five years isn't enough you have right. to go at least 10. that's great yeah so um, it's so when I, uh, when I spoke at the Neuro Leadership Summit the last time in New York, Kevin Oxner from Columbia and one of your colleagues uh, was a respondent. And I said, well, nobody can predict the future. And Kevin said, yeah, you're right, Bob, but our brains try to do it every day anyway. <laughs> so do. that's the tension I'd like to introduce today, that there's a difference between that need to think future back that need to search for clarity, not certainty. But our brains are always trying to predict and that creates attention. Every second, every second, yeah. literally. And the minute something yeah. comes in and makes it hard to predict, like something just right now, like will this coffee you exactly. know, stay? Like the minute that happens, um, we actually get a really strong threat response. It's at least a level exactly. one. Threat. Even ambiguity exactly. actually is often stronger than threat. So yeah, let's keep right. going. Great. So the idea of foresight is to provoke insight. And an insight is very different than an idea. Ideas are great, but insights are precious, precious. Uh, an insight is an aha that creates a new story, a new clarity in your brain. And once you've had an insight, you can't go back. You can't unsee the insight. And foresight turns out to be a very good way to provoke insight, even if you don't believe in the forecast. In fact, some of the best forecasts are those you don't like. Um, forecasts that our, our colleague, Jame Cascio says, the best forecasts are those that are usefully wrong. Um, so the goal, again, isn't to predict, it's to provoke. So roll out one more level here. And again, linking it to neuroscience, um, insight can provoke a new neural story net. So we all have these neural story nets, but foresight to insight, that helps us provoke new stories, new ways to embody clarity. So finally, the purpose of this cycle, um, and it is a cycle, foresight to insight to action, right. the purpose of it is action, an agile way forward expressed with clarity and, and as, ideally as a story again. So what the military folks teach us is they call it commander's intent or mission command or flexive command. You wanna be very clear where you're going, but very flexible how you get there. And here's where we get to the hardest part of the model. Uh, so one more level out, uh, you'll see uh, that our brains want certainty. <laughs> you already said this, David, and you, you teach this all the time. Our brains crave certainty. But as a futurist, I can tell you, I can promise you, even in a VUCA world, that the future will reward clarity, but punish, punish certainty. Because Say more certainty about that. What do you so mean by brittle. that? How, how, how will it punish certainty? What do you mean? It's too brittle. It's too brittle. Command and control does not work in this kind of environment. You want to be very clear about direction, but very flexible about execution. So as talent managers and as people managers, look for the voices of clarity. You know, Bill Gates is a voice of clarity, not certainty. Uh, Anthony Fauci is a voice of clarity, not certainty. Uh, Deborah Burks is a voice of clarity, not certainty. Avoid avoid those people that are stuck in certainty because especially in a crisis time you want clarity but certainty is dangerous it's dangerous because it just isn't flexible enough to deal with this kind of world right it's it's fragile it's interesting it's fragile I'm thinking, about, thinking about um research we've done on on the different levels that people think at um, yes um it's it's really interesting there's a there's a whole body of research um and uh, it's it basically about kind of levels of thinking. And there's a network in the brain for thinking about why you're doing something, right? So, right. you know, I'm, 
it's called it's con construal research it's called right so there's a high mm -hmm. construal which is like i'm <clears throat> you know staying alert and awake on a friday it's by drinking coffee lower construal is like you know drinking something lower construal is like picking up something right so right. <clears throat> as we go up the ladder of construal and we get to the sort of purpose stuff like the the um that tends to be well firstly it's a whole different network in the brain and elliot berkman who's a fantastic researcher and neuroscientist we've worked with done a lot of work on this that certain that the, these high level construal are kind of why you're doing something um, is quite abstract um and it's also quite motivational um and also quite visual but it turns out to right. create a lot of flexibility right and yeah. but it's, it's very sort of amorphous and that's what you're reminding me of whereas the next step is down is kind of planning which is kind of steps yeah, exactly down is, is sort of doing so yeah oh, it, exactly Exactly. And what I'm suggesting is this foresight inside action cycle. If you do it enough times, it's ongoing. It's you notice it's not linear. It's a cycle you have to continue to do. And you should put most of your emphasis on the now. But some of that time you should be cycling from foresight to insight to action. So it's and really if we like, can go. Yeah, it's really like don't try to work out what's happening next. Work out what's going to happen in 10 years and then work backwards. Exactly, exactly. Uh, so now one more rollout here, and this pulls it all together. Um, the DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, uh, did research uh, about why our military stories in Afghanistan weren't working as well as the Taliban stories. And what they concluded was our brains are wired for stories, and if they don't hear stories, they make them up. They make them up. So all of us as great leaders, any leader, has to be a great storyteller. Uh, and this DARPA uh, research uh, uh, paired up master storytellers with neuroscientists, and they told people stories while they were in fMRIs. Now, this is something, you know, this insight that our brains are wired for stories. I learned that in divinity school and all the, you know, all the world's religions know that. Uh, but now we have data. We have data that shows that. So notice how stories appear within foresight, within insight, and within action. And of course, they're also part of hindsight. So we have to be able to understand the story uh, right. as a way of embodying uh, foresight, insight, and action. Yeah, no, it's great. I just a comment, and then I'll take some questions. And folks, just put, feel free to put questions for Bob in the Q and A. It's probably the easiest place to see them versus the chat. But just a, you know, just a comment, like the way that um, we've, we've been learning a lot about learning how to like make learning really work. And it turns out that when you make it social, like literally learn with another person, um, or or think you're learning with another person, either uh, that actually the information is stored um, in a, in, a, in a much richer network. Uh, it's more accessible later. Um, and, uh, and it makes you more likely to, to do things and that, that there's this network, um, uh, for, for, for sort of people interacting with each other that ends up being sort of the, the, the most robust network for holding yes. memories. Now it turns out that also activate what's, what's called the default network in the brain, which is the medial prefrontal, um, and, and there's this whole, it's a sort of like, it's like the, the brain's natural way of thinking. And another way of saying that is kind of. We, the easiest way to get people to process is um, kind of imagining people interacting in time and space. Mm -hmm. That ends up being how the brain kind of at a structural level actually holds memories. A lot of the or easiest is, you know, um, kind of actors and actions, right, in time and space. Um, it's really actors and actions in time and space. And that's sort of the intuitive kind of default way that we store things. So there's a lot of science behind this. We could talk for hours, but I want to make sure we're, you know, getting some people's questions. Um, one of the one of the questions I think is a really central one is you know what would you um, uh, um, actually this is maybe a good place to start you know could you tell a story to illustrate maybe of an organization who did this um, can you kind of bring up bring the cycle alive a little bit with the story sure sure so um, I like how Aaron Sorkin the playwright defines a good story what he says is a good story has to have intention and then obstacle intention and obstacle. So a story, I've worked with Procter & Gamble a lot over the years and uh, at the beginning of the stories, uh, beginning of biotech, when biotech was first getting going, uh, we did a custom forecast for them and it was obvious in this look 10 years ahead at that time, this was almost 20 years ago, we looked 10 years ahead and said, well, biotech is gonna disrupt your business and it's going to change particularly detergents in hair care. I presented to the CEO, who was Dirk Yager at the time, 
Uh, and he looked around the table, the top 12 people at Procter & Gamble, none of them had any biotech background. So the, that was the foresight is biotech will disrupt your business. The insight was the top leaders in the company did not have the ability to make good business decisions about biotech. The action was something that they called the biotech reverse mentoring program, where they paired the top 12 people at P&G with 12 young PhD level biotech scientists. They met for a year, and at the end of the year, they hired a new CTO from the outside, a guy named Gil Cloyd, and A.G. Laffley got promoted to be the CEO, and his reverse mentor ended up being the head of sustainability. So that was a story of foresight to insight to action. That's great. Oh, that's great. Thanks. And what's like, how, what, how would you kind of approach a leadership team uh, to move into a future back discussion? Like what are some of the best questions that you might ask them? Um, you know, I think that um, this model is a good way to start in a foresight inside action. Um, in the new book that's just out uh, just last week, uh, Full Spectrum Thinking, I talk about the mindset of full spectrum thinking, which is that ability to think in gradients of possibility from the future back. Um, and I've got a breakdown there of new leadership literacies and skills associated with them. Um, I think you'll get a link at the end of this workshop. Yeah, but what I'd like to do in terms of talent profile is start from that set of mindset, literacies and skills, and then ask yourself, how do current leaders and how do um, people you're thinking about match up in that kind of world? So for example, um, I'm really interested in gamers. I'm really interested in generational differences. I'm very interested in those 24 or less, what we call the true digital natives. I'm even more interested in those 15 or less, what we're starting to call the cross reality natives. You know, the kids that got the Oculus Quest for a holiday gift this year and then learned how to use it during the, the lockdowns and the shelter in place. So I think these, what I look for is people who can gamefully engage with the future uh, and have the ability to be digitally enhanced in their their ability to do that engagement. And in the military, this is called war gaming. Uh, in business, we've got to learn how to do that too. So you've got to look for people who learn immersively, who see a crisis like this as a learning opportunity. And uh, as you say, never let a good crisis go to waste. Uh, you can look around you Someone now. Someone else's point, but yeah. People doing this. Uh, and and the, the, the gamers are the ones who come out better because they're used to this. They've, they've right. already gamed it. Right. No, that's really interesting. Bob, I need to wrap up because we're going to hear from Amy, but I, I really appreciate your comments. Stay on with us. We'll probably have a couple of questions at the end. And some sure. Happy to do it. I love the insight around we've got to go, you know, way out to come back. You know, we've got to go long to go short because it's just too noisy here. That's really, really provocative. Um, and just that, you, you know, futurists aren't, uh, aren't you know, um, uh, folks that you paid a, you know, uh, story to, what would you call them? Um, the futurists are not, uh, uh, not predicting the future, yeah, not fortune tellers. Futures are not fortune tellers. Fortune -tellers. Futures are not fortune tellers. They're, uh, you know, developing, uh, you know, potential action, you know, insights and actions mm -hmm. um, and scenarios. So really, really interesting and provocative and some lots of great comments. So stay with us. Um, and we're going to go to Amy. Thanks, Bob. Um, Amy, great to have you with us. And uh, I know we've been talking in some really unusual times over the last year. We've been managing to squeeze these moments in. I think one time we managed to find half an hour at, at, up at Boston. One time we found half an hour when I was on a mountain somewhere. And now here we are again. So, here we are, at least, uh, at least seeing each other this time. I know. In the crisis. Very nice to be here. Great to have you here. And for those of you who don't know Amy's work, she's uh, uh, an, an incredibly prolific thinker and uh, writer. She's at Harvard Business School. And she really is sort of best known for developing the concept of psychological safety. Um, and uh, we're going to put up towards the end before the hour, uh, Amy's kind of most recommended book for this time and also Bob. So you'll see a book from each that you're welcome to just go on and, and get. So, uh, but Amy, tell me, um, uh, you know, what, what, I guess for the people who are sort of learning, what is psychological safety just in a nutshell, what is the concept? And then we can sort of dig into why it matters now. You bet. You know, I was struck by the, uh, the, the phrase quiet signals in a noisy brain uh, that Bob picked up on that's your quote and and it occurred to me at that moment that what I study is quiet signals in a noisy organization and and mm. and more specifically that means that in most organizations most teams most organizations there are so many quiet signals 
meaning people see things that that matter that they don't speak up about or they have questions or concerns or have um, ideas or problems and and they hold back and they hold back because far too often job one is impression management and and um, and so psychological safety is is rare but it's it's the opposite of what I just described psychological safety is a a belief that I can bring my full self to work, right? It's, it's a belief that candor is valued. It doesn't make it easy. It doesn't mean that it, this is just kind of easy and fun and joyful all the time. It's just that there's a kind of conviction in a psychologically safe workplace that your voice with bad news or crazy ideas or whatever is expected and, and, right. and will be welcomed. You know, it's bringing to mind an experience I had last week and um, one of my team called me and uh, so we set up a time for a call and we had a call and, and basically the whole intent of the call was to tell me that I'd done a really crap job on a client project <laughs> and that they'd fired me. And, Fantastic. And yeah. I was like, yeah. was, I, I went through the call and I, I was like listening to her and responding and I thought she had some really thoughtful points. And it wasn't until after the call that I realized like my threat level hadn't increased at all. Um, Amazing. Like I was actually, I really appreciated that she, that she'd brought forward. And I worked with this person for a couple of years, but um, you know, she's, uh, she's a fantastic performer. We have a good, you know, good working relationship, but, um, but she was, you know, comfortable to literally say, you know, you, you blew it on this project. And, and the truth is I had, and I was able to explain, you know, we, we were able to clear it up, but uh, I was having a really, really, really bad day. And uh, but it, it's brilliant. Yeah. Because in most organizations, and I'm, I would I would argue, my research would show that that is not the norm. I mean, everybody knows that, right? That's not the norm. And I love that you use the word threat. When I first started studying this phenomenon 20 years ago, I I called it interpersonal threat. I mean, I, I realized clearly there's interpersonal threat in day-to-day -day life. I mean, we care very much about what others think of us. And we especially care in a hierarchy about what higher ups think of us, because at a deep level, we believe our very survival uh, depends upon it. Uh, but, but the presence of interpersonal threat, the reason this fascinated me was that it makes it hard to learn. And I, I came into the research community wanting to study organizational learning, you know, wanting to study what it takes and what are the conditions under which organizations can effectively learn from their experiences, which by the way, I think includes the future. I, mean, I just right. uh, graduated a PhD student um, uh, who, uh, whose name is uh, um, uh, Peter Slocum, who, who did a, uh, a thesis on uh, learning from the future, right? Just really looking at these different, nice. uh, uh, different techniques. Um, but uh, the, the idea of interpersonal threat as an inhibitor to learning, right. um, is very powerful and in, in stating it in the positive, it became psychological safety. Right. And, and, right. and one, of the, one of the most um, robust findings is that it varies within companies, right? That it's kind of a, it's like a team level or a unit level phenomenon. Varies, all right. So you have teams that have really strong safety and, and, and other teams that might have terrible psychological safety. So averages might not be that helpful, but do you think companies have a varying level on average? Of they, they, they nearly always will have a varying level, I mean, bigger or smaller. And, and that's because it, this is a phenomenon that is so very influenced by local leadership, local action, right? I mean, the, the C-level leaders matter, to be sure. Uh, and that project manager, that branch leader, you know, the, the, um, uh, the, even the, the shift supervisor, the medical director in a hospital, I mean, those those kind of leaders in the middle, um, how they show up really, really matters. Right. And I love, I love that Bob started out with the U.S. Army War College, the phrase that I believe we, you know, we hear more and more, the, the VUCA world. Because um, I often will say to people, you know, what if we took this seriously? How would you show up? You know, if you really realize that you are in the midst of volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity, Wow, I mean, you would really want to hear from people, right? Because you're going to miss something. That's just a given. Right. And and yet, most managers, I would say, you know, sort of almost um, just 
show up with a little bit of Frederick Taylor inside their head. You know, that, that my job is to control and make sure KPIs are hit and so on, and then miss the quiet signals in the noisy organization. They've been trained, you know, they've been trained to think about. It. So, let, you know, let's bring this to the environment now. Um, you know, what, what is psychological safety in, in a, you know, shelter in place environment? What does that mean in organization? Well, what are you seeing out there? You know, it's, I think there's a, a kind of um, bimodal aspect. Or there's two countervailing forces, right? On the one hand, this is a very frightening situation, you know, for, for, for most people. I mean, there's a, there's a degree to which our fear levels just skyrocketed. We saw it in your poll, right? But on the other hand, um, the countervailing force is many, many people are finding it easier to be open about their anxiety about because it's acceptable right it's absolutely acceptable to say this is really tough and and by the way i've got some little kids in the other room who are making a lot of noise and you're you know they got a deadline from my my boss or my team and so you know i i think there's a great deal more acceptance of of transparency about what you're up against right because we all know even if i don't know exactly what you're up against i know you're up against something so there's, we're learning to be a bit more open with each other. Right. So there's an interesting trend, you know, threats really high, people are freaking out, but actually there's this deep hum humanity that's kind of opening that's up. Right. In it as well. And I had Deb Bubb uh, from IBM a couple of weeks ago. She's the head of leadership learning and talent there. And, and wow. she was saying, you know, one of the first things that their senior leaders did was actually turn on their cameras and took their people through their homes and said, look, these are my pets. These are my kids. This is what I'm doing. <laughs> and created this immense like human connection. And I, and right. it's just, really helped there. I think that's a, that's something we would never have imagined happening two months ago. No. Um, and, 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 you know, for, for, for many people, you know, they don't have a great backdrop or a great, great um, you know, there's their, their homes are, are messy, you know, they're, they're in the they're, basement. Yeah. Having, so we're, we're all, we're all forced to be more vulnerable. Um, right. And there's a silver lining to that vulnerability. I mean, I, yeah, I, tell me more about that. Tell me what you're hopeful about. Tell me what, what this is. I, that's exactly right. I, I mean, I'm, I am hopeful that we can bring some of that vulnerability forward to the future, right? That we can kind of realize that we didn't, we were open and honest and we didn't die as a result of, of that. I mean, I, sorry, that's a wrong metaphor, but you know how there's a kind of, um, there's always a little, the amygdala hijack is, is a, an experience of, you know, re really, in a way, oftentimes an experience of embarrassment gets translated by the brain as an experience of I'm going to die, right? My, my very survival is at, is at risk because yeah. um, I said something that made the boss scowl. Um, and, and, you know, our, our brains don't do a good job of, of distinguishing um, between kind of real threat and these little, you know, it's the same. It's dark and quiet in there. So whether it's real right. or imagined, it's the same right. in the brain. It's all just, it's just going. Right. It's going and then I'm shrinking and when i shrink i'm not as good at problem solving and so what i hope is we can sort of bring you know we can um if you think about the second job that, that employees have you know if the first job is their job and the second job is the job of looking good the more we cannot have the second job the more we are available to do the first job and and particularly that means being available to each other so a really, a really good metaphor. I, I know Bob Keegan's talked about that as well. Yeah, and uh, yeah, yeah. it's such an interesting metaphor. And, and um, the, the whole area of covering, uh, Kenji Yoshino has been you know, researching that and I've sort of- I love that, yeah. The amount of effort it takes to kind of cover up stuff uh, ends up being very high cognitive load and it would literally right. reduce you know, the, the amount of resource, you know, moment to moment. Um, it's, it's a really interesting frame. You know, one of the things, I think there's a lot of interesting research on um, kind of people who survived really, really intense, you know, life-threatening, you know, experiences, like folks in the army together, for example, you know, a unit in the army who've like gone through, you know, kind of held together. They're bonded in incredible ways, you know, forever. And I think there's going to be an aspect of that, of people in organizations right. have survived the most incredible crisis of their lives for many people, not everyone, but... And so I think there'll be an element of bonding and hopefully that, you know, I'm hopeful that elements of that will stay. Um, and, and some of those things will flow into system level changes. Like, Oh, you know, we don't, you know, we don't rate people on a scale anymore because we, we think of them as humans. Um, right, right, right. And you know, the, this, it needs to go deeper than just, um, you know, hi, how are you doing? Right. It's, it's, it's got to, I mean, I think the best 
uh, the best organizations out there today are engaging in shared sacrifices. I mean, they're doing that explicitly. And the, the higher up you are, the more of a hit you should take because you can, you can uh, yeah. afford it. And, and really, this is an opportunity to focus on, on people and, and what they need, whether employees, you know, even, even suppliers and, and customers. It's sort of, if any company that kind of can stop and pause and, re, and really think about what people need and what they can do uh, to help address that need is, um, is kind of doing the right thing. What, what are some of the best companies doing that you're seeing? I know you're, you're out there speaking to well, firms. What are the best? You know, as I said, shared, you know, it, it's shared sacrifice. Um, you know, some companies, of course, the companies are largely in, in two different categories. One category being, we just saw most of our business disappear, right? And we have to figure out and make some really tough decisions. Maybe you have um, no more than two months cash on hand to really cover, you know, what do you do? And, and how do you distribute that sacrifice? There's other organizations have more work than ever um, because they're of the nature of the business they're in. And so they're trying to quickly figure out how to take care of people who are working in possibly long hours under, under, under dangerous um, right. conditions in some cases. Yeah, no, we, we, our, at NLI, our vision is making organizations more human through science. So we've been kind of very busy. <laughs> um, right, right. And it's because everyone's <laughs> like, uh, I, I, never really worked out how to really think about humans properly. What do we do now? You know, uh, one of the, th the things I think that people have been struggling with is, is you, you have to actually, and I guess you said it, but bring a really deep level of humanity as a leader. Um, yes. And, and that um, means empathy, right? Empathy. I mean, that means, um, you know, it's funny because there's, there's the hard and the soft and the, and the hard is I think you absolutely need to be transparent and open with what you know and what you don't know. And, and, and that includes constant updating. And that's really, that's a discussion of facts. You know, what do we know? What do we not know? And then there's a, just a discussion of, of feelings, um, which is the, the genuine display of empathy and concern with, with, with the right things, which again, are people. Yeah, I know it's really big. I, I, the, the way I've been thinking about it is, um, is is like it's easy to think about the tangible stuff like getting people you know physically safe and companies have done that and now we've got to think about the the, the less tangible stuff which is harder to think about but maybe more important and that is the psychological safety of people you might you might in the sort of next phase we're moving into you might imagine that you can just open the offices again and that they're physically safe and you're doing temperature checks all this but if people don't feel psychologically safe to get into the elevator they're not coming back um, that's right and and if they don't feel psychologically space, yeah. safe safe to, um, to ask for help, you know, when, when they need it or to um, ask for, for a time off when there's maybe someone in their family right. who needs um, extra care. Or it, again, even if they don't feel psychologically safe enough to suggest an idea, like an idea that might streamline a process that will help everybody. But, you know, last time you said something off the wall, someone snapped at you. So you don't want to do it again, right? right. That's, yeah, it's interesting. It's actually a time we need, like, like inclusion needs to be higher because people, like a lot more people need to speak up about a lot more things. And we also need more diverse perspectives because it, it's such a different environment. You need so many different perspectives. So we're seeing actually a, the increased importance of diversity and inclusion overall. Um, although people might think they haven't got time for it, it's actually more important than ever because of the level of innovation that's happening. Um, so we've seen this, you know, hopeful signal that there's, there's a lot more of that diversity and uh, kind of in inclusion interest. Uh, you know, you said something I've been wanting to ask and think about more, which is, I definitely noticed that people at the best of times are really bad at asking for help. Um, and, uh, you know, and I think this crisis might like show that up a lot because um, there's a lot of people who need a lot of help right? There's right. really struggling. So, you know, what do you know about kind of the challenges of asking for help and how do you make that easier at an organizational level? Well, the first thing is asking for help is challenging because people see it as a weakness. So I think, I think leaders, again, at all levels have to get out ahead of that and keep framing asking for help as a strength. Like we don't know what you need. You, you, you know, it's, it, you must ask, right? So I, I think of, of um, you know, a psychologically safe organization. I, my book 
describes it as a fearless organization, which is a kind of ideal state, but it's a, it's a courageous organization. It's a, you know, it's a learning organization. It's a purposeful organization, but it doesn't happen without continual framing of, you know, what does good look like? You know, what, what does like the, the good people are the ones who are telling us what's really going on or asking for help. You know, the, the, the red, the bad news, that's a treasure. Right. So you're, you're, you're constantly, I think good leaders in this, in this um, crisis are fluent in framing, you know, right. and storytelling as we were talking about with Bob, right. It's, it's um, here's a, here's a story of what strength looks like, you know, that looks like asking, raising your hand to ask for help. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because people are really bad generally at asking for help. They, they worry that it's in, an imposition on other people. Right. right? They think other people won't do it, it but, but there's this weird thing that we actually are deeply rewarded when we feel like we've helped someone. So exactly. Flip it around. No, it's a gift. I mean, a chance when, to help you, you know. When you don't ask a question or don't ask for help, you literally are depriving someone else of that small moment of of satisfaction and meaning. That it it's really um, a joyful right experience. I mean, all of us have had that experience when you've been able to solve someone else's problem. I mean, it's like you just feel good, you know, for however right. long you feel really good. And so when we don't give someone that opportunity we're depriving them and that's a reframe right that's a yeah. deliberate reframe it's also true like you get help which is rewarding right. they get true. to help which is right. deeply rewarding for them it's actually everyone wins i'll close with this one idea i've been sort of throwing out there i think there's an incredible issue around fairness in companies of some people who have like 130 percent capacity because they're not traveling and others who have 30 percent capacity because they've got kids and everything you know and uh, you know, folks who are having to be out in public and not. And I think, you know, some companies should be exploring kind of internal bulletin boards, almost like a internal Airbnb kind of thing of like, hey, I, I need this, you know, does anyone want to help? I need this, anyone want to help? Yeah. People asking for sort of crazy things they need help with, like tutoring their kids in math and, you know, stuff you can do safely. And then oh, other people, it's brilliant. we need That's that kind of stuff happening inside organizations. Yeah, a little exchange market, right? I think it's brilliant. I have two sons who, who are 19 and 21, and they're brilliant at teaching math. Right. And they actually one of them is tutoring kids in California. I don't know how it, that was set up by someone, right. but it's, you know, it's just they like doing that. Right. right. But a lot of parents don't market. don't, don't love, love doing it. I need. Yeah. Um, I mean, you need to wrap up there, but um, stay on with us. And Bob, if you want to come back on. I just, um, you know, the title of this uh, of this session today is um, about uh, like literally feel, you know, thinking about the future and kind of, you know, feeling better about thinking about the future. And I want to kind of summarize, you know, a couple of things I think you know, from Bob, I'm, I'm coming away clearer about how to think about the future more effectively. Um, like stop trying to find the quiet signal about the next step, just give up that. There's the, the signals are so noisy right now, just try to find the quiet signal like five years down or 10 years down um, and then think back. That's really calming. It's given me a lot of clarity <laughs> and hopefully others. And the, the you know, the, the thing about um, you know, focus on certainty and, and you've inspired me to, to go deeper into quiet signals in a noisy brain and, um, and, and kind of mm -hmm. finish that big piece of work I've been doing. So it's been great to have you, Bob. And, and um, Amy, really, um, I'm really inspired by um, your hopefulness about the increase in psychological safety that could happen out of this. And I, and I think it can. And I think um, one of the things for organizations to do is don't you know, lose the opportunity of this crisis to create a more human organization in some way. Um, to, to raise the value of the stuff that might be less concrete and tangible, but maybe more important, which is the psychological safety. Because just because you've, you've got temperature checks doesn't mean people will come back in the building. Um, <laughs> just because, you know, we get, they're going to have to feel psychologically safe in every sense of that word mm. uh, you know, in this next stage. So really, really interesting insights. Any closing comments from you before we go to some, uh, some, closing, some closing thoughts for folks and resources? Yeah, um, I'd, I'd like to just respond to what Amy said and draw um, a big link. I think looking long and thinking future back is a way to actually develop your psychological safety because wow. you're practicing dealing with the VUCA world in a low risk way. So nice. I think that whole discipline of foresight, insight, action helps us develop our clarity, but, but moderate our certainty. Beautiful. You're a master connector. I love that. I That's love cool. that. I love that. I mean, it, it's, it's like, the, it's like um, the use of simulators in flight mm -hmm. training or in medicine where right. you sort of go exactly. through, you go through the worst in a safe place. Exactly. Um, and you can bring that strength back. 
Yeah, that's fantastic. Look, thanks to you both. Um, I just want to mention, I give a plug for Bob's book that just came out uh, literally last week uh, called Full Spectrum Thinking. I think Bob, we were going to put a link or something in so people could get a, is it like a discount? Exactly. Or There's a book. discount code on the link. Great. We'll put that in the link now in the chat. So there's a discount code. It's just come out. Um, you know, Bob's work's always phenomenal. He's, you know, one of the master framers of how to think better, particularly about the future that you'll, you'll ever have the privilege to meet. So thanks so much, Bob, for joining us. And You're Amy's welcome. book, um, uh, The Fearless Organization, I was asking her, what's the best book? You've written so many. What's the best book for kind of right now? And she said, The Fearless Organization. So we don't have any links on this one. We just kind of did this very quickly before, but um, this is probably the best book to dig into if you've got a little bit more reading time. Um, <laughs> and uh, speaking of having time, just a couple of closing comments. Uh, at NLI, we've been thinking about how do you help people come back to level one threat at worst? What are the critical habits? We see three. Take care of yourself better than ever. Look after each other better than ever, deliver what matters better than ever. We've been thinking about the critical habits underneath that. We have some open enrollment programs starting every week, literally, um, of you know, three one-hour sessions once a week to kind of really walking you through the science and practice of this. So just jump to our website if you want to see that. Uh, we're also running this in-house in organizations. You could literally take 100,000 people and make them focus much better in one month. Um, completely virtually in a very, very measurable way. So we have some super scalable ways of delivering this uh, completely virtually. We've actually, be, actually been in the virtual business for 15 years um, and show we have data showing workshops to the worst option for habit activation um, compared to the virtual stuff we do. So it's actually a great time. Individuals, uh, how we're helping individuals. We have a fantastic brain-based coaching that's now going back to fully virtual. We used to do that. Um, there's one of those starting every month or so. We have the six month certificate. If you're really interested in the science, it's a fantastic six month certificate. Um, and if you're from an organization at a senior level, we have weekly talent events with small groups getting together many times a week on very specific topics. So reach out if you're from an organization and, and interested in that. And then just finally, how we're helping firms. Um, we're briefing top teams. So we're doing a lot of briefings with CEOs and CHO teams. We're helping companies actually with that reinvent culture, learning or performance work with some really fascinating projects. Um, and you can see some of the things that we're doing. But inclusion's coming back. We have some very, very scalable work there. Um, and then finally, Gabe, I think you've got a poll just to wrap up. Um, do you want to put that up? Just tells us kind of how we can help you. Um, if you're interested in, in sharing that, we appreciate your, uh, your, your, your clicks there. So we know kind of how to follow up with you best. Um, and just in closing, um, thank you so much, uh, Amy and Bob, for being here with us. Uh, really appreciate your insights. We've had a ton of insights. Uh, lots of things. I'll probably follow up with both of you um, and uh, appreciate your time. So thanks very much. Thanks to Gabe as well. Take care of yourselves. Back over to you, Gabe. Thank you so much, David, and Amy and Bob. What, a, what an amazing discussion today. The chat has been on fire. I'm sure it was hard to keep up with all the comments coming in both on the webinar today and on LinkedIn Live. So thank you again for joining us. Um, and thanks to all of you for attending on both platforms and bringing your insights to light. Um, some really compelling things going on back there. Um, a couple quick reminders before we let you go, and if you need to drop, of course, please do so at your leisure. But for those remaining, if you'd like to watch this webinar again or share with colleagues, uh, a recording will be sent by Mary Grace Rapola by end of the day today. So be sure to fill out the form that Mary Grace is also sharing on LinkedIn Live if you'd like to get a copy of that. Um, and you can respond to her directly in that email if you'd like to explore deeper conversations with any client advisors here at NLI. Your Brain at Work Live will continue ongoing Fridays at noon Eastern time. Next Friday's episode will feature two great guests from industry leaders in the pharmaceutical industry, Gioti Mera of Gilead Sciences and Doug Shupinski from Merck. So be sure to join us from there. I believe uh, both Anna and Mary Grace will be sharing some links with you where you can go ahead and register uh, right now. That's again next Friday, May 8th at 12 p.m. Eastern. And another reminder to, to subscribe to Your Brain at Work, the podcast, which Anna and Mary Grace should also drop in the chat for you both. Um, and you can stay up to date with all of our upcoming global programming as we run webinars from offices in EMEA and APAC as well. So lots to choose from in varying um, time zones. This otherwise concludes our session for today. On behalf of the NLI team and our panelists today, we wish you continued safety and good health during these challenging times and hope to see you next week. Have a great weekend. Bye, everybody.